Hello everyone. In this video I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about bedrooms and closets. So first we'll be looking at some historical precedents. We'll be looking then at some basic bedroom furniture, lighting and accents, the master suite, and then we'll touch on closets and closet systems. So first some historical precedents. So thinking back in time, you know, bedrooms and beds, you know, haven't always been what we have today, right? Uh, so the, the history of the bedroom and beds has, it, it, it's long and it's changed. It's kind of an interesting peek into the past. So, um, you know, when we think about, you know, what our experiences are now, we can look back through time and see, like, for example, the bed on the upper image there, an ancient Egyptian bed. So we might kind of put ourselves um, in that bed, uh, you know, with the mat actually on top, putting our heads on the left side of that image. But actually, that's the end of the bed. Your head would actually go on the other end. So different than we might expect, right? Uh, the image on the lower right is a traditional um, Chinese bed type of structure, so built in. You can actually put hot rocks underneath and warm the bed in the colder months, which of course I think sounds pretty comfortable actually. Um, and then, you know, still currently um, the lower left image uh, are individuals weaving the grasses to create sleeping mats, right? So throughout time and currently bedding is still a very different um, different thing in different parts of the world, different cultures. So looking back into some, uh, you know, historical periods, first kind of going to that medieval uh, time in history, you know, we didn't have private bedrooms and, you know, the same kind of privacy, I guess, that we have now. So, you know, during that time, things were very different and there was a strength in numbers. And so people, you know, spent a lot of time in these great halls, in these same rooms, um, not in their individual spaces again. So, you know, these great hall areas, you know, everything happened there. Cooking, um, eating, you know, business transactions, marriage, birth, death, um, even sleeping, you know, all that happened in this area, era. So, uh, you know, it's a completely different experience. Um, and this is actually, you know, the time period where the, you know, the phrase hitting the hay and, um, you know, the use of a curfew actually came in. So moving forward in time just a little bit, it brings us to uh, the Tudor beds and bedrooms of the 16th century. So, um, you know, the middle class, um, you know, at this point, starting to actually get into their own homes. Um, you're starting to get some of those private spaces that we might, you know, think of, um, you know, wanting to, you know, wanting to have. Uh, but at this point, you know, bedrooms are still pretty sparsely furnished. Um, you know, having a bed um, and possibly a trundle bed actually underneath. You can see in this image where the bed actually pulls out from underneath. So it's really two in that space having a, a simple chest for clothing. Um, so pretty, pretty simple in that respect. But still, um, you know, a lot would happen in these spaces, births, weddings, um, death, you know, even at this point, socializing. So it's a little bit more still of a, a multi-use space than, you know, we might think of right now. Uh, moving forward into the 17th century, um, things are you know, starting to evolve and change a bit more. And here we're seeing um, the idea of the steward beds. And uh, the beds and bedrooms, you know, are still a prominent thing for uh, middle class, the ruling class, the noblemen. Um, and, and the larger homes would actually have bed chambers. So a series of rooms that uh, would also include a separate bedroom for the husband and wife, along with separate um, closets and, you know, multiple spaces. So, um, you know, really kind of beginning that evolution of this privacy. Uh, at the time, the closets weren't like dressing rooms, uh, like we might see today. Um, the closet was, you know, a smaller space actually reserved for the man or the woman of the house. Um, it was private and, you know, used for prayer and, and solitude. Um, in this image, we actually happen to see the, the oldest uh, bed in England, at least it's believed to be, built around 1608. It's been in the uh, Berkeley Castle for about 400 years. Uh, 
Uh, then we move forward into the Georgian and Federalist style beds and bedrooms of the 18th century. So, you know, again, beds, bedrooms are, you know, undergoing significant changes. Uh, you know, homes were beginning to be built with more internal hallways, which, you know, you might not think about, but it used to be that you would, you know, have to travel through one room to get to another, but actually having interior corridors um, internal staircases, you know, this suddenly means that you can actually have more privacy and rooms that, you know, you don't have to pass through. Um, so bedrooms are becoming more and more private. This is an image um, that of a restored um, Federalist bedroom in Massachusetts, uh, originally built in 1792. Moving forward yet again into the Victorian beds and bedrooms of the 19th century. So, you know, again, homes are being built with private bedrooms, these interior corridors. And so the, the master and mistress of the house were getting, you know, these, um, you know, these big grand bedrooms or separate bedrooms for the children. Um, so big changes were happening. Uh, but, you know, it's also important to remember um, not everyone was able to live this way. And, for example, in New York City, the tenements were uh, very, very overcrowded and unsafe and many, many people living in very, very crowded conditions, as we see in the image on the left. So, uh, you know, we're kind of seeing the ideal version of that progression in you know, the image on the right. But not everyone, of course, was able to live that way. Moving into the 20th century, um, you know, having an image here on the left, the lavender room from 1924, and then the green and blue room from 1944, uh, you know, things are starting to change again. Um, and this gets us into um, the idea of being more colorful, being more highly decorated spaces for more of the average person. Uh, and in post-World War II, uh, we had a, you know, a boom of soldiers coming back from the war, getting married, building houses, you know, small, um, you know, two, three bedroom houses. Um, so, you know, big things were changing. And um, you know, just kind of looking at the, the image on the right, from 1944, um, just kind of calling out that there's a crib in the corner with, you know, everything highly coordinated and matching um, with curtains that you could pull to actually kind of hide that area if you wanted to or close it off. Uh, you know, again, thinking about this 20th century bedroom, we start to get all sorts of different looks. I mean, pretty rapidly, um, you know, through the 1900s. So getting Scandinavian design. Um, and that's actually the introduction of the duvet at that point. So you could you know, suddenly get away without having layers and layers of all this different bedding if you didn't want it. Uh, you know, and thinking about a lot of personal expression, individuality, you know, and all of the things that are going along with the changes in the decades. Once you get to the 80s, um, you know, and then of course beyond, that's when we really start to see the concept of the master suite in a you know, standard middle class home, you know. Um, and so the standard, uh, you know, master suite, we're having, of course, the large bedroom space, walk-in closets, attached, very large, usually, uh, bathrooms. Uh, we might have sitting areas, fireplaces, TVs. I mean, it's really practically an apartment within the house or larger apartment. Children's bedrooms um, at this point are beginning to be constructed in the new build homes with their own private bathrooms as well um you know they're larger they're um you know meant to accommodate you know play areas and all that as well so you know space is getting kind of larger and larger in the standard house as they're being built um, now we'll look a little bit at uh, bedroom furniture lighting and accents so when we think about bedroom furniture you know of course we're thinking about the bed right uh, but you know we can also be thinking about, you know, the space in general, how it's laid out. What else is that bed kind of interacting with, right? So we look at these examples. We can either choose to have a, a bed just kind of up against a wall and the wall being treated as the headboard, as the backdrop. We can have an attached uh, headboard like we do in that middle um, image, which is actually even floating out in the middle of the room. And then we also start to think about the accent furniture that might around, be around it. So do we have a side table? Um, you know, is it, you know, something kind of free floating? Do we have, you know, plants, decorations? You know, what else is in that space? What does the bedding look like? 
And then how are we handling lighting? And in these three examples, whether the bed's sort of floating away from the wall or up against the wall, um, instead of having the lamp actually on those side tables that each instance has, there's fixed pendant lighting coming from the ceiling so that you know you actually get that table space um, and you don't have to have a lamp on it. You're looking in these examples, you know, all of these have this sort of gray and blue, very soothing, serene color scheme, uh, but, you know, handled differently. In the left, we have a low platform bed with, you know, padded, upholstered um, kind of um, structure built all around it, you know, very soft, you know, kind of uh, very comfortable pendant lighting hanging. Uh, in the middle, we have a bit more of a raised higher up bed with a padded tufted headboard. And then the wall painted in the very high contrast dark tone to um, really set that apart with pendant lighting again. And the image on the right, we're actually carrying that headboard color up the wall and over the bed and, and, and hanging a chandelier to really create a special space, a zone in the room, uh, which is very unique. These three images are all, you know, representing um, high contrast, you know, strong light to dark contrast um, with that dark accent wall, whether it's kind of that dark gray black against the white that we're seeing on the left and against that light colored floor, um, bringing wood and natural materials and really accenting that kind of vaulted peaked ceiling that we're seeing in the center and how expansive and large that can that can feel or you know working with a you know sort of floating wall and open concept that we see on the right and actually you know here again um, you know thinking about that end table but attaching it to the wall at this time you know so that we actually have that floating space underneath um, and creating a very different look and feel you know, as we think about the, the headboards or the accent wall, the main wall in the bedroom, we can be thinking about, you know, including those natural materials. And in this case, each one has a wood plank type of a look, but the left, you know, it's very dark, horizontally run. In the center, it's that reclaimed kind of idea, you know, a lot of different colors and kind of textures happening, running vertically. And then on the right, a bit more of that contemporary kind of grayish tone, large platform uh, bed that almost looks like it's floating. So very different looks um, with, you know, similar actually kind of materials. Um, you know, and the bedroom spaces can also be fairly bold and dynamic in, you know, in the, in the sense that they can be very colorful or, or very, very high contrast. You know, all the previous examples are a little bit more subtle, a little bit more peaceful, um, but you can bring in a lot of intense contrast and color um, if that's something that the client wants, right? Um, so some people, you know, thrive with color and, you know, and dominant shapes and they want to express themselves that way, um, you know, such as the image on the right, um, where other people might find something a little bit more dark and moody, like the center image, um, you know, more comfortable. You know, and here we can also see, you know, instead of thinking of a side table as just a table, using a chest of drawers, increasing the storage, you know, bringing in that macrame, that hand done element, and the more eclectic kind of look with the accessories, um, you know, can be really quite lovely. Thinking about the master suite, you know, specifically, um, you know, what kinds of things do you want to think about? Well, you know, first and foremost, we really want to consider privacy. You know, this is this is a, a place of rest and rejuvenation. And so you want you want peace and quiet and all that. So, you know, in terms of you know, how you lay that space out, it's ideal in many cases if you can put a closet or some kind of barrier, um, you know, between that bedroom space and the other spaces, you know, just as a buffer, whether it's the rest of a house, uh, you know, apartment or whatever it might be. Um, you know, and thinking about also the view out the windows, how we configure the furniture in the space, how the light's coming in, you know, and how that might be hitting the bed at different times of the day. Um, and, you know, as we think about the design of the bedroom to the bathroom and closets, and if you include, for example, a study or anything like that, uh, you know, how we can make this maybe feel open and large, 
which, you know, can be very luxurious and, and wonderful, but can that can also reduce privacy. So, you know, if you're going to have, for example, a kind of open floor plan from the bedroom into the bathroom area, you know, you might kind of consider doing like a, a toilet in its own separate room or alcove, things like that to still, you know, afford the, the um, users some privacy. Couple other layout examples here. The one on the left is a pretty straightforward, standard, um, you know, example. Walk into the bedroom. The bed is, you know, center on the main wall, nightstand on either side, then having some sort of um, dresser or desk or something like that in front of the windows. And then the bathroom and then the walk-in closet, you know, make up the other half of the space um, and kind of our side by side. So it's a very common type of layout. The layout on the right side of the screen, you know, has us walking in, looking, you know, straight at the wall with the bed, which can be very impactful. Um, we have a bit of a larger bathroom wrap around type of walk-in closet in this scenario with also the addition of a you know separate alcove for a sitting space that type of thing so similar but different types of layouts and when we actually take the master suite um, and put it into a floor plan you know, we want to think about where does it go and how much space does it take so in both of these examples uh, you know seeing this uh, master suite, for example, on this one over on the left, you know, we can see that it's not necessarily centrally located in the footprint of the space, right? We tend to, you know, put the master bedroom kind of off to one side, the master suite, or maybe even on a different floor, depending on the on the building that you're working on. Uh, but, you know, if we're thinking about keeping it all on the same level, you know, putting it off to one side, allowing that bedroom, um, you know, to kind of be as far away as possible for peace and quiet. Um, and then we can see that, you know, it really can take up a significant amount of the square footage. In each, in each case here, the, the master suite is probably taking up about a third of the square footage. So they're very large spaces, you know, and, and are very important. Um, in the design. So just looking at a couple of more examples, you know, and seeing how we can have a master suite that's really very connected to the rest of the space like we see on the left. And also the image on the right um, is seeing the backside um, uh, of that bed wall from the other image and how you can have a very open concept bedroom to bathroom scenario and how that can really flow to be a very open um, contemporary space. Uh, you know, again, showing the bedroom area flowing into, uh, you know, a more, you know, quote unquote public um, area and how we can shut those off with doors, you know, curtains and, uh, and all that type of stuff. Um, and, you know, we can see that these spaces can have very, very different looks, very different personalities. And then just taking a look at the idea of closets and, and what we're working with there. Um, you know, whether it's a small closet or a walk-in closet, there's some things we need to keep in mind. So when we're thinking about the depth of things, you know, the standard depth of hanging clothing, like, you know, how big is the clothing on the hanger? Somewhere in that 21 to 24 inch um, size is about, is about typical. Um, if we're thinking about, you know, the construction of the closet then, for a small closet, we really want to be at about 24 to 28 inches deep. That's about right. So any narrower, you might not be able to, you know, shut the doors, the, clo the clothes will be poking out. So 24 to 28 inches deep for a small closet. The shelves then, if you do have shelving, uh, you know, like maybe you have that shelf up above the rod or something, it's really around like 12 to 24 inches deep, usually. Um, and then if we're thinking about walk-in closets, that type of scenario, um, we see some examples, you know, down at the bottom of some typical configurations, you know, a four by five foot example right here, you know, showing that 24 inch depth of the hanging clothes. Or over here, we have a four by seven foot example. So getting some clothing hanging on either side. Um, so those aren't particularly large, but would be walk-in closets. Um, and if we're thinking about ADA, then the depth has to be a minimum of five feet deep, absolutely, for ADA. Uh, you know, and here we're seeing another bathroom um, 
bedroom combination, a master bath. Um, and here, instead of having a walk-in closet, you know, another way to handle this might be having these shallower closets running along the corridors before you get to the sinks or then going into the rest of the bathroom. Sort of a different way of handling it, but you know, can also work. And um, you know, up here we're seeing sort of an example of a, a designed, um, you know, closet system before any, any clothing or anything's been hung uh, in that space. And just a comment on the lighting, you know, really avoid, you don't wanna do bare bulbs in a closet, you know, an actual covered light fixture is important. Um, and it, an exposed bulb in a closet can be an actual fire hazard. If the bulb does get hot, depending on what kind of fixture it is, that could actually start things on fire. So it's very important, not only for appearance, but for safety. So looking at closets just a little bit more, um, here the image over on the left is seeing a floor plan view and how if you have adjoining rooms, you know, for example, bedroom here and a bedroom here, the in-between wall, you can notch it in such a way that you get a closet, about half of the closet in this room and half in that room, for example. It's a really efficient use of space. Thinking about, um, you know, the closet running down the corridor like that, giving ourselves at least that three foot clearance and about that four feet across here, if it's gonna be kind of that open scenario. Uh, and then here over on the right, we're seeing a bigger, you know, sort of a more dramatic uh, walk-in closet scenario. So we're maintaining that three foot clearance all the way around, right? And we have a chest of drawers type of situation going on the center with all of the hanging going on around the perimeter. And then down at the bottom here, you can see a elevation of, you know, some typical um, configurations for, you know, a designed closet system. Um, so we have a standard scenario here with the rod hanging, you know, you know, clothing hanging full length, like dresses, that type of, or coats or longer things, with shelving above. Uh, we can have pure shelving structures, you know, for putting shoes and things like that. Um, and then we can also have the double uh, rod situation where you're hanging like jackets, tops um, up at the top and then generally like, you know, skirts, pants, things like that down below and seeing some of the typical measurements that might be. Um, and if we're thinking of um, this sort of double rod situation and where those numbers land, if we kind of follow that over, you know, we'll see that. Um, you know, with that double rod scenario, we're probably around 80-ish inches for 80 to 82 maybe for that top rod and around 40 um, for the lower. Okay, and then for the single rod, we're around that 72-inch mark for the single rod. So they can vary a little, but that's pretty typical. Uh, and so here's just a few examples of, you know, that sort of closet system, uh, you know, executed in real life so they can be very kind of posh and fabulous with um, you know sitting areas and chandeliers and recessed lighting and they can be actually kind of decorated spaces they can also be a little bit more simplified in a sense with integrated lighting dressing mirrors and all that um, and we can actually also you know have windows inside of our closets we can have desks and workspaces and they can be kind of multifunctional spaces few more examples, just different styles, different looks, um, but you know, all uh, of these kind of closet systems and ways to you know, display and arrange the clothing um, in a really beautiful and super functional way.